And for our next guest, I'd like to, I'd like to welcome Dominic Jacks, who is the UK and European patent attorney at Jill Jennings and & Emery. And we're going to talk to us about the intellectual property for digital therapeutics and opportunities and challenges. So over to you for 15 minutes. Thanks very much indeed. Great, thank you, thank you. Right, so um, amazing to see such a, a busy room for a talk about intellectual property, but I won't look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, so this is just gonna be a really quick gallop through just a few basic bits of information on intellectual property. Um, and since we're on the mental health stage, I'm gonna talk specifically about some of the issues that come up um, when dealing with intellectual property for what we would call digital therapeutics. So I'm expecting most of you are familiar with digital therapeutics, um, but in case not, um, what I'm talking about here is basically software that aims to produce some kind of therapeutic effect in the user. So if you have in mind, for example, um, a game on a phone that an Alzheimer's patient might use, which um, when they play this game regularly, improves their symptoms, something like that. Um, so just to sort of introduce myself and my company, GJE, quickly. Um, we are a specialist firm of intellectual property advisors. We work with tech companies to protect their IP and um, investors to do, for example, due diligence and um, you know, make sure that the intellectual property and the, the technology of the companies that they're looking at investing in is um, securely protected. Um, I'm part of our specialist group of um, digital health attorneys who spend a lot of time researching um, the law specifically around sort of med tech, health tech. And for the last year or so, we've been doing a lot of research into how the patent system is treating uh, digital therapeutics technology. We actually did a similar exercise last year for surgical robotics, um, which we produced a white paper on with just some practical advice around this area, um, which went down really well at Giant last year. So if you're interested in a copy of that, uh, let me know where I can give it to you. Um, so just to give you sort of a bit of, the, bit of the motivation for why we've been looking into this um, so closely, um, you don't really need me to tell you that the med tech sector produces a huge amount of innovation, right? Um, but just to put some numbers on it, um, the European Patent Office, every year they count up the number of patent applications that they've received in sort of each area of technology. And med tech basically comes out top every year. Um, last year it was number two to digital communication, which is like telecoms and things. Um, but basically, if we take patent filing numbers as a kind of proxy for innovation investment in the technological sector. Medtech is, is absolutely huge, um, and that's not even including pharma, which is sort of down there about number five. So a huge amount of um, investment going into this area, a lot of intellectual property being generated, which basically means that if, if you're active in this area, if you're dealing with tech in medtech, digital health, um, patents are, are going to affect you one way or another, whether you're trying to sell something, someone might have a patent that affects you. Um, if you're in, you know, investing uh, in a company, you will need to be aware of sort of other patents that might affect the company you're thinking about investing in. And um, digital therapeutics is no exception. In fact, again, looking at patent filing numbers, um, it's really grown rapidly in the last decade or so, as you'd probably expect, you know, personal electronic devices, smartphones becoming ubiquitous, everyone's got one, um, which has really sort of opened up interest in this idea of um, software that an ordinary person can interact with to, to generate sort of therapeutic effects. Um, so that's, that's why we've been so interested in this. Um, this stuff is, you know, coming across our desk as patent attorneys more and more. Um, but what we've identified through our research is that there are a few specific challenges in this area um, when it comes to protecting the technology. And so we just wanted to give you this sort of really, really brief overview of what those challenges are, just so that if you're a tech company in this area, an investor, um, hopefully next time this comes up, you'll just, you know, you'll just twig it um, and have in mind that these challenges are there. So as I say, um, we've identified a few challenges that are sort of specific to um, patenting, so protecting with intellectual property, digital therapeutics technology. Um, what this really stems from is the fact that there are a couple of um, rules 
on the European patent law that restrict the kind of technology that you can protect. The first one, and probably the most relevant one, is this first thing here, an exclusion from patentability of methods of treatment by therapy. Um, I'll explain this in more detail in a second, but basically what it means is the patent office will not let you patent um, a kind of abstract um, method of therapy. Um, the next one that's relevant is that the fact that there are certain restrictions on the kind of software you can patent. Um, again, I'll explain this in a second. Um, and this is all kind of compounded by the fact that with this being a new area of technology relative to the time it takes things to filter through the patent system, there's not really a lot of case law in this area. Um, so basically what we see in practice is that there's a kind of inconsistency in how patent applications in this field are treated, basically depending on which examiner you are lucky or not lucky to, to end up with when you file your application. Um, so just to explain these legal provisions in a bit more detail, um, so as I say, the first one is this thing to do with methods of treatment by therapy, as they call it. So the law in Europe says that you cannot have a patent for methods for treatment of the human body by therapy. And what this, what this really does, um, it stops you getting a patent that you could use to stop other people carrying out a method of therapy sort of as, as an abstract concept. Um, there is sort of a good reason for this, which is that when they designed the patent system, they didn't want to grant patents that would enable people to sue doctors for basically giving their patients the best available methods of surgery, therapy, diagnosis, whatever. So there's a good reason for it, um, but it's something you have to deal with when you're trying to protect technology in this area. The next thing is this, this thing about computer programs I mentioned. So this exclusion on your ability to protect therapeutic methods doesn't actually stop you protecting the technology that you've used to deliver the therapeutic method. So if you've come up with a device that implements a kind of approach to therapy, you can patent that device basically no problem. So in the context of digital therapeutics, we're usually talking about something like an app is how we're gonna deliver the therapy. So we say, okay, well, we're not gonna ask for a patent for the underlying medical theory, say, um, but we'll try and protect the app that we're gonna use to deliver our therapy. And that's a sensible approach because in a technology company doing digital therapeutics, a lot of the value actually is gonna be in the app that they're putting into the marketplace. Unfortunately, when you, when you try and take that approach, what kicks in is this um, rule on computer programs and the fact that basically the patent office doesn't let you have protection for what they call computer programs as such. Um, basically what they mean is they don't want to give you a patent for abstract sort of software in and of itself. They want you to show that your software has some kind of real world effect before they give you a patent for it. Now, in our context, digital therapeutics, it seems pretty obvious that our software does have a kind of real world effect um, because we're saying it's software that you interact with and it produces this therapeutic effect, right? Unfortunately, what we've seen in practice from the cases that we've looked at that are ongoing at the moment, when you try and make this argument that our digital therapeutics application is patentable because of the real world therapeutic effect it produces, the patent office basically swings back round and says, well, hang on, you tried to protect a therapeutic method, so we're not gonna give you a patent for that. And when you find yourself in this situation, you can basically end up in this inescapable trap between, on one side, the exclusion on patenting therapeutic methods, and on the other side, um, them not allowing you to have a patent for the software that implements it. So, basically, if you're, if you're trying to protect technology in this area, you need to make sure that your IP strategy and your patent application is not gonna run you into this inescapable trap. Um, and this, you, you really need to deal with this at the outset when you're preparing a patent application, right? Because a patent application, once it's on file, um, basically the content of the application is fixed. You can't go back and change it. So if what you send to the patent office in the first instance looks to them like something that falls into this trap, 
you're going to have a really hard time working your way out of it. So basically, our, our conclusion here is that whenever, whenever you're trying to protect technology in the digital therapeutics area, you, you need to get it right first time, you know, more so than any other area of technology where you might be filing a patent application. It, it, there really is this big risk of this fatal trap that you might fall into, basically. Um, what we're sort of looking for as, you know, as patent attorneys when we're, when we're drafting application in this area um, and trying to be aware of this trap, um, we're basically looking for an advantage, just going back to the thing on computer programs. Um, we're basically looking for some kind of real-world effect that is something other than the therapeutic effect. And you perhaps have to be a bit creative here. You might say, oh, the GUI works better, or the software is more efficient, something like that. But anyway, that's sort of you know, more for us to worry about. What I want you to take away from this is just that there is this, this particular challenge um, and not a lot of high-level um, judicial um, guidance, if we can put it that way, on this area. So it's just, it's just an area where particular care is needed when you file that first patent application. Um, fortunately, that's where your, your patent attorney comes in, whether you're you know, an investor, a tech company, um, someone like us or whoever your IP advisors are, um, should be able to, to help you uh, f foresee, these, uh, foresee these challenges um, and address them at the outset. Um, but that's it, as I say, so just a really, a really quick gallop through this area, basically. Um, our white paper will be coming out soon, and that will be on our website. Um, I should point out, we are offering um, free IP clinics, um, so just sort of 30 minute chat or so, if you sign up with the QR code here, if you have IP questions of any kind, you can have a free meeting with you know, a patent attorney, one of us, um, just to give you some sort of free pointers and a, and a basic outline of what's going with your IP. Um, other than that, um, unless there are any questions, I will um, hand back over and let us get on with the startup showcase. Dominic, thank you very much indeed. If you could show your appreciation for Dominic's, Dominic's presentation. <laughs> just, just before you go, is there any questions from the audience while Dominic's here? Yeah, we've got a lady at the back. Hello, thank you for that. That was really interesting. My name's Jude. I'm a psychiatrist in Newcastle. I have a question about large language models yep. and um, whether any application designed based on them might be protectable. Yeah, um, th yeah this, this is, um, that's an area with its own set of challenges, basically. I, d I don't know if you've got any experience of trying to protect technology in that area, but if you've if you've read into it at all, I think you'll appreciate there are a few, there are a few separate challenges there. Um, it, it can be done. Um, in this area, it sort of comes back to this thing I was saying about looking for a kind of real world effect. Um, so they don't want to give you a patent for something that they would call just software as such. Um, they also don't want to give you patent protection for sort of what they would see as a pure mathematical method, which is the kind of thing that your LLM might fall into. Um, but if you can demonstrate that that LLM is achieving some kind of real-world effect, so let's say like you're, you know, um, using it to control like Alexa or something like that, um, that is the kind of effect that they would would recognise as conferring sort of patentability on that that invention. So I certainly, you know, if, if anyone's working in this area, I wouldn't be dissuaded from um, filing patent applications in this area. It is protectable technology. Again, it's just one of those areas with a, with a couple of wiggles that you need to, to bear in mind when you, when you file an application for this kind of thing. So I'm, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Time for one last question, anybody? I think you've filled them all in. Right. Dominic, thanks very much okay. again. Thank much you very appreciate much. It.